Hi everyone, I'm Shelly and you're watching There's No Place Like Home. I'm back today with another Paradise Found video and today we're going to be reading Part 6, Chapter 1, The Bearing of Our Results on the Study of Biology and Terrestrial Physics. How seemed this globe of ours when thou didst scan it, when in thy lusty youth there sprang to birth all that hath life, unnurtured and the planet, was paradise, the true Saturnian earth. Far toward the poles was stretched the happy garden. Earth kept it fair by warmth from her own breast. Toil had not come to dwarf her sons and harden. No crime, there was no want, perturbed their rest. Edmund C. Stedman, The Skull in the Gold Drift the solution of the problem of life may come from an unexpected quarter. John Fisk If the alleged facts and the conclusions of the foregoing chapters shall be accepted as correct, it is plain that in finding the true answer to one of the longest standing and most baffling of the problems of biblical theology, we have at the same time found one of those central key truths, acquaintance, acquaintance with which affects a great many other kinds of knowledge. Indeed, it is not too much to say that the acceptance of this alleged truth upon its appropriate evidences must affect men's estimate of the sources of knowledge. For if the sacred traditions of mankind, when once rightly interpreted, are discovered to be in astonishing harmony with each other, and to yield results which are most advanced sciences, working in the most varied fields of research, singularly conspire to verify, this discovery cannot fail to give new significance to history in all its departments and in all its teachings. But apart from this general effect of a verification of ancient testimony, our precise conclusion as to the, as to the location of the cradle of the human race has a most evident and important connection with all physiological, paleontological, archaeological, philological, what a mouthful, mythological, ethnological, and culture-historical speculation. In a word, a most evident and important connection with about every problem which in a marked degree attracts and occupies our modern thought. In the present part, it is proposed to notice the relation of our facts and conclusions to a few of these fields of study, and first of all, in the present chapter, their bearing upon the study of biology and terrestrial physics. In part third and in the seventh chapter of part fifth and elsewhere, we have already had various illustrations of the fascinating and authenticating light which the biological sciences can throw upon the study of prehistoric traditions. Possibly the reader, if devoted to this kind of study, has wondered why a field of illustration so rich has not oftener been utilized by writers upon antiquity. But however important this bearing of biological upon prehistoric studies may be, it should not be forgotten that the counterpart bearing of the study of the earliest traceable thoughts and beliefs of mankind upon biology and upon the most fruitful study of biology is not a whit less important. This is a point of utmost moment to the fields of knowledge concerned, and also to the general theory of personal and organized culture, yet it is a point most infrequently brought under the consideration of thoughtful readers. It is an unfortunate and ominous fact that the average biologist of the present day sees nothing worthy of his professional attention back of the present century. The intellectual history of the human race has not the slightest interest for him or value for his work. Ages on ages of human observation and thought and speculation touching the problems of life are to him as if they had never been. If he acquaints himself with them in the slightest degree, it is usually only for the sake of amusing his hearers with what he considers the grotesque and absurd ideas of former times, and impressing them with the contrasts which latter-day, quote, science presents. For all that his race has done until just before his own immediate teachers began, he is little more than pity and contempt. Now, in any department of human learning, such an attitude of mind is certainly to be deplored. Its effects are detrimental in every aspect. In proportion as it prevails among any class of intellectual workers, in just that proportion does that class become isolated from the one collective and historic intellectual life of humanity. 
In this way, the collective intellectual life suffers, and yet more do the isolated workers suffer. Humanity, conscious of an intellectual history, naturally comes to pay little attention to these men who deny it, or take no interest in it. On the other hand, any class of men who ignore the history of the human mind and begin all true history and all true science with their own achievements, by this very procedure place themselves outside that spiritual fellowship in which all forms and fragments of knowledge find unity and mutual supplementing. The circle of their intellectual sympathies and tastes is narrowed. With the loss of broad sympathies and tastes, they are in danger of losing even the capacity to discern and appreciate any kind of truth outside the limited range of their own specialized field of professional research. So far has this perilous tendency already gone that it is a difficult thing in any country to find a celebrated biologist whose publicly advocated theory of education for his own fields of labor does not quietly ignore or actively antagonize the broadening historical and humanistic studies, which alone can qualify a man for intelligent sympathy with all good learning. Unless the tendency can in some way be checked, there is positive danger lest the special cultivators of biology and the natural sciences become as narrow and isolated and influenceless a guild of experts as are the antiquarian catalog makers of modern Europe. In studies like the one which has thus far engaged us lies the best possible corrective for this one-sidedness. In this field are found stimulation for the student's curiosity, facts for his understanding, arguments for his reason, play for his imagination. And all the time his study of nature and his study of man are mutually helpful to each other. He now has nature and her life before him in two forms. First, as she has entombed herself in the great cemetery of the rocks, and secondly, as she has pictured herself in historic and even prehistoric human thought. If the former gives her with greater tangibility, it is only the tangibility of the moldering skeleton. It is the latter which shows her alive and filled with all life's meanings. Each is important in its own place, both being reciprocally corrective and mutually complementary. As yet, the biologist has not profited by ancient conceptions of nature, as he should have done. How long and slow has been the progress of the botanist up to this latest conception that all the life forms of the vegetable kingdom proceeded originally from one center and that at the pole the ancient iranian myth of the tree of all seeds from which proceeded the germs of all species of plants that ever grew and which moreover was located at the north pole ought long ago to have suggested to him the truth as to the genetic unity of the vegetable kingdom and also as to its pristine center of distribution the same may be said of the zoologist and the suggestiveness of the myths of the same people respecting the primeval ox and the gosh, the personification of the animal kingdom. In these survivals of ancient culture, we have the forms in which prehistoric zoology expressed the unity, the monogenesis, and the north polar origin of the entire fauna of the earth. It is now perhaps too late for the biologist to gain from these particular myths the instructions which generations ago they could have given him. By slower and more painful methods, this beautiful polocentric conception of the vegetable, animal, and human worlds has at last been reached. The problems of earliest floral and faunal and ethnic distribution have shut men up to its existence. I'm sorry, to its acceptance. But if the discovery of the accordant significance of these ancient myths has been equally delayed, we may at least indulge the hope that the unexpected agreement of the prehistoric conception with that of latest science will inspire in candid students of nature a new and higher respect for the primeval teachings and beliefs of mankind. Meantime, let it not be forgotten that there are other myths of equal antiquity and possibly of wider prevalence, the significance of which for the progress of biology may today be as great as ever was that of the tree of all seeds. Notice, for example, this curious fact, that while in ancient East Aryan thought the gods on Mount Meru are of prodigious stature, the proper tenants of the adjacent regions are somewhat less, though still gigantic, 
and they seem to dwindle regularly in size from Varsha to Varsha, until we reach Bharata, the Varsha which borders upon the equatorial ocean and is peopled with ordinary men. And as if the inhabitants of Hades, being still farther to the south, must be by some law of nature still smaller than men, Prince Satyavan's soul, when led away to Yama's abode, is described in the Mahabharata as only a thumb in height. A striking gradation, everyone will say. Beginning with beings sometimes represented as miles in height, it ends on the borders of the land of death with disembodied spirits whose stature is only a thumb's length. But this conception of the range of the kingdom of generated and mutable life was not limited to the ancestors of the Hindus. In the most ancient Greek thought, the proper habitat of the pygmies was near the equatorial ocean river. Farther northward was the abode of men. Still farther proceeding, one came into the region of giants. While in polar Olympus the gods were so colossal that in his fall prostrate Ares covered seven acres. Traces of the same remarkable adjustment are found in other mythologies. Possibly this far-off prehistoric conception has some significance, some lesson for the biology of today. What should this lesson be if not that in all our researches into the origin and sustaining conditions of life, the phenomena of the highest north should be taken into account? Too long have those who busy themselves with these investigations been turning their attention to the ice-cold abysses of the deep sea, hoping in some bathybius clot of the sunless ocean bottom to find the protoplasmic power which has transmuted inorganic matter into microcosms of organic life. In no such region of cold and darkness should this search be made. Let life's beginnings and life's feeding forces be looked for where its supreme vigor and exuberance have been seen, at the pristine center whence the types and forms of life have spread victoriously through the world, let them be studied at the pole. On this subject, as conservative an authority as Principal Dawson recently remarked, it is not impossible that in the plans of the Creator, the continuous summer sun of the Arctic regions may have been made the means for the introduction, or at least for the rapid growth and multiplication, of new and more varied types of plants. In this true center, what new and interesting aspects the problems of life immediately take on. Here we have a regnancy of sunlight, such as we never dreamed of in our lower zones. Here we have a tension and a direction of terrestrial magnetism, with whose biological significance we are utterly unacquainted. Here we have electric forces, which pour their currents through every grass blade, and tip the very hills with lambent flame. Shall not such absolutely exceptional biological conditions and energies be found to yield some exceptional biological result? Is not this a more hopeful field for the study of the origin of life than the dark and almost congealed recesses of the deep sea? The old theologians were accustomed to call Adam and Eve the protoplasts. In their ancient polar home, it is possible that science may yet discover the divine secret of all protoplasm. Again, our new interest in one of the terrestrial polar regions gives fresh significance to the contrast between the two. Within 10 years, our most eminent American geologist has said, I find no explanation in the present state of science, wherefore most of the dry land of the globe should have been located about the North Pole and of the water about the South. Physicists say that it indicates greater attraction and therefore a greater density in the solid material beneath the Southern Ocean. But why the mineral ingredients should have been so gathered about the South Pole as to give the crust there greater density is the unanswered query. It may be that magnetite is much more abundantly diffused through the Antarctic crust than the Arctic. This is only one of many possibilities and it is at present without a satisfactory fact to stand upon beyond the general truth that iron was universally present. But the diversity of the two poles is as great and as perplexing to the biologist as to the physical geographer. The researches made show that the two polar regions differ greatly. The seas of the Arctic teem with animal life, 
Land animals such as the bear, wolf, reindeer, muskox, and arctic fox are scattered over the frozen surface of the land where they find the means of sustenance. The air is peopled with innumerable flocks of birds. A hardy vegetation extends close up to the arctic circle and beyond it in mosses, lichens, scurvy grass, sorrel, small stunted shrubs, dwarf trees, and in summer beautiful flowers. In the Antarctic, on the contrary, vegetation ceases at a certain limit, trees terminating at about 56 degrees south latitude. Animal life abounds in the seas, but though birds exist in great numbers and in varieties unknown in the Arctic, no quadrupeds are found upon the land. With this we may compare the already cited language of Sir Joseph Hooker. Geographically speaking, there is no Antarctic flora except a few lichens and seaweeds. Would it not seem as if the South Pole must have been covered by the barren sea at the period when floral and faunal life, starting at its Arctic center, began its conquering marches over all the earth? Or is there some rather some marked difference in the biological value of the poles themselves? But polar biological research involves antecedent polar exploration and a wider and more systematic study of terrestrial physics. Herein lies a fresh and novel impulse to reinvest on every side the still uncaptured citadel of the Arctic Pole. Long ago, could Maury write, as science has advanced, men have looked with deeper and deeper longings toward the mystical circles of the polar regions. There icebergs are framed and glaciers launched. There the tides have their cradle, the whales their nursery. There the winds complete their circuits, and the currents of the sea their round. There the aurora is lighted up, and the trembling needle brought to rest. There, too, in the mazes of that mystic circle, terrestrial forces of occult power and of vast influence upon the well-being of man are continually at play. Within the Arctic Circle is the pole of the winds and the poles of cold, the pole of the earth and of the magnet. It is a circle of mysteries, and the desire to enter it, to explore its untrodden wastes and secret chambers, and to study its physical aspects has grown into a longing. Noble daring has made Arctic ice and snow-clad seas classic ground. It is no feverish excitement nor vain ambition that leads men there. It is a higher feeling a holier motive, a desire to look into the works of creation, to comprehend the economy of our planet, and to grow wiser and better by the knowledge. If such a passion for discovery could be kindled in the presence of the older and more abstract problems, what ought to be the result when to these are added the possibility of solving at least some of the mysteries of nature's life, and the certainty of standing where human life began? And that is the end of today's chapter. Thank you so much for listening. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed and would like to hear more of what I have to say, I would love if you would do that. If you have any questions or comments, you can leave them below. If you like my work and would like to support my page, I will leave a link in the description for my channel membership, or you can just click on it right on my channel page. And I hope you have a great day.